Hi, I'm Brett, papercartridges.com. At the shop today in uh, rainy Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So this is a great day to uh, drink some scotch and talk about rifle muskets. And that's what these are here on the, on the desk. These are rifle muskets that entered service and were in military use before Claude Meunier comes out with uh, his famous mini ball. Uh, and that's, that's what we will focus on today. Not all early rifles, but specifically the first rifle muskets. And you're familiar with what rifle muskets are, especially if you're watching this channel, which means you're a person of uh, culture and intelligence. So you know a rifle musket is a musket-length percussion muzzle-loading infantry weapon, but that it has a rifled barrel. And there were earlier rifles, uh, Napoleonic War and, and earlier. So for instance, think of like the Baker rifle from uh, the Napoleonic era. You could shoot it, but it took a long time to load the thing. Compared to a smoothbore musket, you can get about three shots off with the smoothbore musket in the time it takes to load a, the, the Baker. And the bullet, it takes longer to load because the bullet is wrapped in a patch, either a leather or a uh, cloth patch, and that's a very tight fit as you're loading it because it has to grip the rifling. And it takes some work, it takes some force, especially after you've fired a few shots, to get that bullet loaded into the barrel. So the militaries of the, the early 19th century and before, they knew about rifles, but they didn't see much of a military application because they take so long to load. And the range is not that surprisingly uh, poor, honestly. Uh, Rob's channel, British Muzzle Loaders has some uh, awesome videos where he goes and shoots his baker, which he needs to shoot more often, uh, <laughs> if you want my opinion. But uh, I don't remember the longest range that he fired at, but it surprised me how, how inaccurate they were, like the, the dispersion of the group, you could say. And this is why the militaries up until the early 19th century weren't big fans of the rifles, but they were all anticipating what the discovery of like the military firearms holy grail and that would be a rifle that you could load as quickly and easily as the smooth war and this had been anticipated going back to the 1700s uh, the father of modern ballistics uh, benjamin robbins he was the first one to use math like actual uh, modern mathematical physics to describe the effect on a bullet uh, with gravity and air resistance. And his ballistics calculations held up. Uh, th they were very, very good. They were slightly off, but they held up uh, up until the modern day. And he wrote back in the 1700s that whichever country or whichever group figures out a way to get rifles that you could load as easily as you could the smoothbore musket, he said that is going to revolutionize the face of the battlefield as with such an order of magnitude change like the original discovery of gunpowder in the first place. So it's, it's going to be that big a deal. And that is what a lot of people are anticipating is coming. And they're trying to figure it out. How do we get a rifle to be loaded as quickly and easily as a smoothbore and the obvious military advantages that's going to come from that. So, of course, the British came up with it first. Uh, a, a Captain Norton uh, came up with a self-expanding bullet remarkably similar to what would be the later Burton-style Minier uh, bullet, self-expanding hollow-based bullet. And uh, another uh, British gunmaker, William Greener, also came up with a expanding bullet. So naturally, they took these inventions to the Board of Ordnance. And uh, the Board of Ordnance told them both, these are useless whimsies, and we're not going to waste our time with them. Round ball was good enough to beat Napoleon. It's going to be good enough uh, from here on out. So the, the, they got rejected by the military authorities. So this means, and I hate to say it, it was the French <laughs> who first field the modern rifle musket. And it was a French officer named Henri Gustave Delvin, who's kind of one of the unsung heroes of the 
the early modern firearm. But he, his brilliant idea was to take a chamber and put that in the breech of the rifle so that the soldier would load the round ball, a regular musket ball, like the, like the smoothbore musket would fire. But the round ball wouldn't fall down all the way through the chamber. It would come to rest on the edges of that chamber. And then the soldier, when he rammed it down, would, uh, we're going to use some very highly advanced technical language here, so try to hang on. The soldier would wail away on the bullet with his ramrod until the bullet was smooshed out into the rifle. Very highly advanced technical language here. And it worked. Believe it or not, that round bullet, if you bang it enough times with your ramrod, it gets squeezed down and the lead fills the grooves of the rifle. And that causes it to spin. It's almost like a flying disc. And the thing is accurate. So Henri Gustave Delvin thinks he's discovered the holy grail of musketry and goes to the French government. And the French government is not impressed at first. So he says, hold on, I will cover the cost for trials. I will pay to have rifles built and we can do a large scale test. So the, the French government agrees. Why not? You're going to foot the bill. So Delvin has 20 rifles made, and they go out, they test them against the smoothbore at various uh, distances. And long story short, uh, on average, the Delvin rifle is seven times more accurate than the smoothbore. The government, however, is still not that impressed, because while the Delvin rifle is more accurate, it's, it's not consistent. You can't like aim at one point target and put the bullet through that target every time. It, the dispersion is one-seventh less than the, the musket ball, but that's not saying a whole lot. So the, the government was not ready to adopt this because the bullet is too deformed. It's the deformation of the bullet, which, which is what causes it to expand. You have to do it. But that very deformation is, uh, is the Achilles heel of the system. Also, another uh, aspect of the Delvin chamber system is the bullet just gets dropped down the barrel. There's no grease or, or, or bullet lube which you need to soften the fouling as you continue firing. So after several shots, your rifle barrel is just caked with this hard fouling and it becomes increasingly difficult to load uh, subsequent rounds and the accuracy just falls off a cliff so for these reasons uh, the delvin the original delvin system uh, the french government said uh, no and if you think about it uh, delvin almost suffered the same fate as norton and greener did uh, back in england the government was not interested in his invention but the situation was a little bit different for the French because it turns out they really needed rifles. Uh, the British in the 1830s didn't really, they weren't fighting a war where the tactical need for a more accurate weapon was pressing. So the French end up getting involved in a decades-long war in North Africa, in Algeria. And the uh, the French army, a Western European army, lands in uh, North Africa and they go to fight the Algerians and the French are in lines of ranks with smoothbore muskets and they see the Algerians in the distance and the French start blasting away with volleys of musketry like they would in Europe. And the, the Algerians are... Uh, they don't conveniently form up in lines and fight them the way that... Uh, that the French were anticipating. They're hiding behind rocks. They're hit and run guerrilla tactics. They'll take a pot shot from here. They'll take a pot shot from there. And the French would blast a volley that way. They'd blast a volley this way. They're firing tens of thousands of rounds and inflicting no casualties. So the French are, by this point, the, the 1830s, we need a rifle. We need a rifle right now. So... Uh, someone does come to the rescue because the Delvin rifle uh, on its own is it's just not going to cut it. But the breakthrough comes with a French artillery officer, Colonel Ponchara. So he's an artilleryman and he understood uh, the, the new 
Pikeson guns, how they work. So the Pikeson gun is an early shell gun. So what it fired an exploding shell, which existed before this point, but previous shells, you had to make the walls of the iron quite thick in the shell. So the cavity where you held the gunpowder was pretty small in older shells. Uh, Pikeson figured out a way to hollow much more of the shell out, but uh, and they tried that before Pikeson, but that shatters the shell. The shock of firing would break a thin-walled shell. And Pikeson got around that by attaching a block of wood behind the shell. So the wood would absorb a lot of the blast, that initial shock of firing, instead of it being transferred to the shell. And that would push the shell out the barrel rather than it, it shattering. So Panchara simply took this concept and he miniaturizes it down to fit in, a, in the Delvine chamber. And he attaches this block of wood, which is called the sebo, uh, French word for shoe. So think of like the wooden, uh, the old Dutch wooden shoes. And he attaches the sebo and he hollows out uh, a half spherical cup shape on one end of the sebo to hold the bullet. And again, this is all about preventing the deformation of the bullet. And he attaches also to control the fouling, he takes a patch, a greased piece of fabric, and that gets tied to the bottom of that wooden sibo. So when this assemblage gets rammed down the barrel, it's the wooden block, that wooden sibo, is what's resting on top of the chamber. And the soldier still has to smack it three or four times very strong with his ramrod, but the wood is taking the brunt of the, the impact on the face of the chamber. The wood compresses a little bit, spreads out, helps to fill the rifling, and the bullet does as well. The bullet is still being smacked. It's, it's being uh, squashed down by the blows of the ramrod, but because it has that backing from the wood, it's not quite as bad. So the bullet is deformed, but not as deformed as it was in the original Delvine system. And this works. It works. Uh, the accuracy is better than, the, than Delvine's original system, and the uh, patch softens the fouling so you can sustain longer shots. So it is the Delvine Panchara rifle that ends up being the first rifle musket that actually gets issued to troops. And I forgot to mention, if you want to see these shot, uh, the chap over on Bloke on the Range channel uh, has a couple videos shooting the Panchara system out of his original rifles. They go to rush them to North Africa. They're given to the Chasseurs d'Orleans, and uh, they use them in combat. And there's a young officer, a lieutenant in the Chasseurs d'Orleans, uh, named Claude Etienne Minier in North Africa using these weapons. And of course, we will hear his name again uh, shortly. Um, and again, the, it's still a round lead ball and it's still being deformed. So the, the Delvin Panchara system works. It does not work perfectly. It's got modest accuracy. So now the, the task is, how do we improve on this system? We want, to, we want to do two things. Well, you need to do three things, actually. You have to prevent the deformation of the bullet, because the deformed bullet is not going to fly with any uh, accuracy. You need to avoid the greasing or the buildup of fouling in the bore. So you have to have a way to prevent the, the buildup of fouling. And you want the bullet to still expand and grip the rifling with the minimum possible smacks from the soldier's ramrod. So the, the next step is a simplification of the bullet away from that uh, panchara sebo to a pointed bullet, uh, what the Austrians called the spitzkugel, literally pointed ball, uh, pointy ball, <laughs> you might say. Um, a, a prototype of the bullet-shaped bullet. So now instead of a round ball, we have a point. And that's what this rifle is. Uh, this is a Model 1849 Kammerbuchse, which has been converted to percussion. Originally, these had the, the Austrian two blocks. 
But the Austrians started adopting these chamber rifles, Kammerbüchse, in the early 1840s, and they used this much improved form of the bullet. So it's no longer a round ball. You have a pointed bullet, and the greasing of the bore is accomplished. Instead of the patch around the sabot, you have a pretty deep groove in the bullet, and you can pack grease in there, sometimes a greased string or a greased thread. And that does a surprisingly good job keeping the barrel uh, from being clogged with the black powder fouling. And it shoots, honestly, this thing shoots better than it has any right to. <laughs> uh, if you're interested, I have an earlier video on the Garibaldi rifle, which is what uh, Civil War soldiers called the, the 1849 uh, Kammerbüchse. And it, it sh astonished me at how accurate this system works. It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't work this well. I was very surprised. But the soldier is still smacking this thing three or four times to expand it. Uh, the, the heads of the ramrods were shaped to minimize how badly they're deformed, so they tried to match the, the point of the bullet. But still, you're smacking it three or four times to s physically squash this lead down into the rifling, and it causes significant deformation to the bullet. Each bullet's ballistics is a little bit different than the last one because the the lead moves in different ways. So we finally go back to uh, Claude Minier. Uh, and at this point in the mid, early, mid 1840s, he's working with a team of geniuses uh, at the French, the French Army's rifle shooting school at Vissan. So you've got Mini with uh, Captain Tamiger and uh, Louis Etienne de Tauvenant. And my pronunciation is probably very, very bad uh, <laughs> for, for these French names. But these guys are, all three of them are geniuses. And they are experimenting with everything. So new shapes of bullets. And each one contributes something. Uh, Minier proposes the cylindrical conical bullet. So finally, we are getting into what you could call the modern bullet-shaped bullet. So a better ballistics and they're always trying to find a way to prevent as much deformation of the bullet as possible. Tamije is, uh, he comes up with the, what we call cantilevers. Sometimes they're called lube grooves, but this is the, the final shape of the mini ball with the ring. So it's the cylindro conical bullet. And he finds that these cantilevers make the bullet shoot more accurately. And de Tauvenon comes up with a way to expand the bullet with even less deformation. So instead of the chamber, uh, Tauvenon inserts a pillar into the breech of the rifle. Uh, and that's what this is. This is a Model 1848 Danish tap rifle. So in the breech here, there is a steel pillar sticking out. And in Tamiget's, or a de Tauvenon system, rather, the bullet uh, gets expanded by being forced down onto that pillar. And because it's being forced onto a pillar, which is going to force the lead out, that only takes one sharp blow from the soldier's ramrod instead of the Delvin chamber system, where it requires two or three blows because you're physically flattening out the bullet until it expands out into the rifling. With the Tuvenon system, which in French is the carabine à tige, in English it's normally the pillar breech rifle. The, the bullet sets, uh, you, you ram it down and give it one good smack and that uh, the pillar forces the lead out. So instead of squashing it flat down into the grooves, now the lead is being pushed out from the center. And this works very well. We're finally, we're almost at that place where Robbins uh, predicted that you have a rifle that you can load as quick and easy as the smoothbore, yet it shoots accurately. Uh, and you could, you could load a Tuvenol system rifle pretty much <laughs> the same speed as you could a smoothbore. And these are much more accurate than the Delvin chamber rifles. We're talking predictable accuracy now out to about 500 
yards. And these catch on. The Delvin chamber system was not widespread, but the Tuvenon pillar breach system is far more practical and a lot of countries start adopting them. In fact, they start taking their smoothbore muskets, they unscrewed the breech, they would drill and tap a pillar into them, and then they would rifle out the smoothbore musket barrels and they were rifling new rifled muskets using this system. So it takes off. The French, uh, Prussians, uh, the, obviously the Danes, most continental countries in Europe end up adopting a pillar breech uh, rifle musket. And it, it works pretty good. And then in 1849, of course, uh, Minier makes his fairly small leap ahead, uh, but it, it, it had much more far-reaching consequences of taking out the pillar, and instead of the bullet being expanded by the pillar, he put an iron cup in the base of the bullet. And the blast of the burning gunpowder, all that pressure would force the iron cup up into the hollow base, and that would expand the bullet. And he even called it the surrogate tige. So it's, it's a replacement for the stem, for the pillar in the breech. Uh, both the pillar in the breech of a Tuvinon rifle and the iron cup in the Minier ball are doing the same thing. The only difference is uh, one is expanded by the soldier ramming the bullet down onto that pillar and giving it a good hard smack. And the other one is simply depending on the, the pressure generated by the burning gunpowder to smack that iron cup up into the base of the, of the hollow-based minier ball. So that was what was going on in Europe. And I'm here uh, as the captain of ordnance. Uh, so it's reasonable for me to discuss what uh, similar rifle developments were going on in the United States in the 1830s and 1840s. None. <laughs> we never, Delvin, Panchara, Tamizier, and uh, de Tuvenon, the names are almost unheard of in the United States. Uh, it, it is, that's unfortunate because these were like the, the apostles of musketry. But we had the Hall rifle for the U.S. Army, breech loader, fires a round ball. And we also had the Model 1841, uh, sometimes called the Mississippi rifle. It also fired a patched round ball. So even though it's a percussion lock rifle, it's still being loaded exactly the same way as, uh, as the Baker rifle was 30 years before uh, with a patched round ball. Uh, so the United States completely, totally late to the rifle musket party. Uh, we had never adopt a Delvin chamber breech rifle. We never adopt a Tuvenon pillar breech rifle. And it's only until the, we're into the 1850s. So the Minier system is now replacing both of these earlier systems, and we hadn't adopted either of them. It's the 1850s, and the army starts to realize we really might want to look into this whole rifle musket thing, uh, because they're now becoming general service in Europe. So we start experimenting in 1853, 1854 at Harper's Ferry. Uh, we, uh, the United States Ordnance Department acquires some books <laughs> from, uh, from Europe and we're reading about the TJ uh, Tuvenon system. TJ, it's not TJ. I have to keep correcting myself. I know it is TJ, but for some reason it's got an E at the end of it and I'm used to German. Dreise, I want to say TJ. It's TJ. But we read about these things in books and we uh, make some pillar breech rifles at Harper's Ferry. And we test them against the Minier style rifles. And of course, the Minier system works a whole lot better. And that's what we end up uh, going with. In 1855, the US Army finally adopts a rifle musket, the US Model 1855, with, uh, with the simplified version of Minier's bullet, we just took the iron cup out. Uh, the, because the United States has such a small army, we, we could really spend our time making very nice, tight, 
fitting tolerances on our rifles. So we didn't need that iron cup to force the expansion. We can get away with just relying on the pressure of the gas. Sometimes this is called a Burton bullet after the James Burton, the master armorer at Harper's Ferry, who uh, came up with this design. He really stole it from Delvine. He didn't know he stole it. He didn't know that Delvine had proposed a hollow-based pointed bullet like 10 years before. Uh, but uh, this gets used through, through the American Civil War, uh, but it was really, really late to the party. But muzzle-loading rifles uh, after this point would see no further improvements uh, af after the plain breech minier system. The next step is breech loading, and then the next step is the metallic cartridge, which has its own primer in it, which is never going to catch on. I mean, the soldiers, they're going to shoot all their ammo off if you give them a self-contained cartridge. It was good enough for Grandpa to load his bullets one at a time, ram them down with a stick. It beat the British. We don't need any of these metallic cartridge newfangled things. So that's never going to catch on. But for any survivors <laughs> who have hung on this long, uh, I hope you enjoyed this, this rainy day deep dive into the first rifled muskets. And if you like this sort of... Uh, gun nerd uh, content. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you like and subscribe. And again, I am Brett from paperpartridge.com and I will see you next time.